Today's episode is brought to you by Restaurant.com. With Restaurant.com, you can save at thousands of restaurants across the country with just a few clicks. Their dining deals range from $5 to $100, never expire, and cost you a fraction of the face value. Dinner has never been easier with Restaurant.com. Used for dine-in, take-out, or delivery. Restaurant.com is offering our listeners 50% off their next purchase by going to www.restaurant.com forward slash podcast. That's www.restaurant.com forward slash podcast for 50% off your next purchase. Restaurant.com, the best deal every meal. Hey guys, just to let you know that I have a promo of another podcast playing at the very end of this episode, so please stay tuned until then. I look back at the um, photographs of all the flowers and the pets and the ponies and the little cottage and <laughs> it was, uh, was a very, uh, very lovely existence. I remember when I used to walk back with Josie and then and Megan, um, I think they were quite laid back and, and very at one with nature because I remember we would find things like a bird's egg or something and we'd take it home. Then we'd just let us do things like that and um, yeah, it was nice just walking home amongst you know the fields and things all pretty. I've got this vision uh, this image in my mind of them in their little blue gingham dresses with their uh, satchels. They went to a swimming gala that day, I do remember that. Um, so they may have had a couple of towels there as well, sort of draped over the, the satchel. So um, that's the last I saw as they went into school that day. Yeah. Hi m ms welcome back to another episode of Murder and More. As always, I am your host, Kira. Broadmoor Hospital in Berkshire is a high-security psychiatric hospital that houses some of Britain's most notorious and dangerous criminals including Robert Knapper, Peter Sutcliffe and John Straffen. Broadmoor Hospital is run by the NHS and serves to prove that there is a credible link between mental illness and violent crime. In an article for GQ magazine in June 2019, Dr Daz, a forensic psychiatrist, confirms that whilst not all mental illness will cause a person to become violent, there is definitely a link between certain mental illnesses and violent crimes, such as grievous bodily harm, sexual assault and murder. The most common diagnoses amongst imprisoned, dangerous individuals are psychotic illnesses, including schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder and bipolar disorder. Whilst this doesn't guarantee a person with these conditions will immediately become a danger to others, Aggression is known to be portrayed as a direct result of symptoms, such as paranoid delusions or auditory hallucinations displayed by individuals with schizophrenia. The link between mental health and violent crime is muddied slightly by confounding factors such as drugs and alcohol, being a victim of physical, sexual or emotional abuse in younger years, an unstable childhood or family home, and being exposed to violence such as domestic abuse. The Russell family consisted of Dr. Lynn Russell, Dr. Sean Russell and their two young children, nine-year-old Josie and six-year-old Megan. The girls' personalities were a stark contrast to each other. Josie was described as almost being the leader. She had a bubbly character, was highly motivated and had many interests. On the contrary, Megan was the quieter one of the two, much more of an introvert. Whilst she was shy and not as outgoing as her older sister, 
Megan was quietly determined in everything she did. Whilst the girls were at school and Sean was out at work, Lynn loved tending to the garden with one of the children's friends, Lucy, describing her as being, quote, at one with nature, end quote. Lynn was never afraid to get stuck in and could always be found doing gardening, building or DIY work around the house. Lynn would be at home looking after the home and the animals. She did all her own work around the house, whether it was gardening, whether it was decorating, knocking down a wall with a sledgehammer. You'd, <laughs> if she wanted to get something done, she'd do it. In early 1996, the Russell family moved to a small village in Kent from North Wales. There they lived in a beautiful cottage in the middle of the countryside, surrounded by fields and wild flower meadows. They really couldn't have asked for a more idyllic or picturesque location to bring their two young girls up. The 9th of July 1996 was just like any other ordinary day for the Russell family. Lynn got the children up and ready for school and the family sat down to eat breakfast together before Sean took the girls, wearing their blue gingham dresses and carrying their book bags, to school. After taking the children to their local primary school, Sean then headed into work for his 9am start and Lynn began to tend to chores around the house, washing up after breakfast and doing some gardening. That day I took the children into work myself and that was one of the days in which I did deliver them to school. The thing I can remember about the last few minutes with Lynn was it was the normal morning rushing off to school, saying goodbye, the sunlight there and the garden, the flowers, and Lynn going off and me thinking, well, she'll be immediately getting stuck into the gardening or the housework. At 4pm that afternoon, school was finishing up for its day of learning and Sean ran some errands around town. He had a bike in for repair, so he went to check the status of its condition and he returned some books Josie and Megan had borrowed from the local library. The children had a swimming gala after school, so at roughly the same time as Sean was running his errands, Lynn began the beautiful walk through the fields to the school to collect the girls once the gala was complete. Lynn had already informed Sean that after the swimming gala, she would take the children to their brownies club and would get a lift there and back with the girl's friend, Lucy's mother. Sean arrived home at roughly 7.30pm that evening and when he returned and the lights were off and the house completely empty, he wasn't concerned and began preparing the family's dinner. As the sun began to fade on the day, Sean began questioning why the girls still hadn't returned home. He still wasn't panicked until he received a call from Liz Gregson, the local woman who was taking Lynn and the girls to Brownies at about half past eight. That phone call would be the catalyst to Sean's concerns. Liz informed Sean that when she'd arrived at the house at 5pm to take the family to Brownies, she was shocked to observe that the house was closed up and the lights were off, no doubt in the exact same condition as when Sean had arrived home hours later. This begs the question, where were Lynn, Josie and Megan? Why had they not made it home after school? And if they had made it home, where on earth were they now? As the evening set in on the warm summer's day, concerns surrounding the family's whereabouts and safety mounted. At 9pm, enough was enough, and Sean realised this was a serious situation and phoned the police. The police informed Sean that they'd had no reports of any local accidents that day, but Sean made the decision to check for himself and drove the route the girls would take to and from school, but to no avail. Desperate for answers and now panicked, Sean even contacted their vets to make sure the family hadn't needed to rush their dog to the vet and simply forgot to call home and inform him. Again, to no avail. Next on Sean's agenda was to contact the local hospitals to ensure that no one under the name Russell had been brought in. The family had now been missing for five hours and Sean became more and more frantic. Unbeknownst to him, despite the girls only being missing two hours at the time he'd contacted the police, 
They still took the call seriously and had set a search team in motion to try and locate them and bring them home safely. Liz Gregson arrived at the cottage to assist in the search and shortly after, at about 11.30pm, police with canine units swarmed the home. As the teams moved into the local countryside at about midnight, where Lynn would have walked to pick the children up from school and bring them home to get ready for brownies, two police officers sat down and began interviewing Sean, building a picture as to the events of the day and acquiring more information as to what Lynn, Josie and Megan looked like. They also probed deeper into any factors as to why Lynn may have decided to run away with the children, asking Sean about his and Lynn's marriage and the family's life together as a whole. However, it would very quickly become apparent that Lynn hadn't just run away with the girls and they'd met a much more horrifying fate as they walked home from school that afternoon. When police officers sat Sean down in his living room, just an hour after the search had begun, he knew they weren't about to offer him any positive information. They called Liz and John Gregson outside and one of the two police officers and explained to them what was happening and then the other guy came back in and I knew the moment I saw this policeman coming back into the house um, his body language, the look on his face that something terrible was wrong. The police officer had to inform Sean of the heartbreaking news that it appeared his whole family, his wife, two children and even the family dog had been murdered. Sean recalls the officer's words. Quote, I'm sorry to have to tell you, Dr. Russell, that we have found your family, not far from here, and they have been in some sort of accident. It's very difficult for me to tell you this, but I'm afraid none of them has survived. End quote. It transpired that the girls were located just several hundred metres from the house, in the bushes along the country lane they frequented daily. The girls were just a couple hundred metres from safety, but unfortunately they were cruelly denied such security on that fateful summer's afternoon. At that point, the case has become a murder investigation and Sean was taken to the local police station for more intense questioning. On the car ride through the pitch black country lanes of Kent to the police station, the events of that night began to sink in. I do remember when I was away from Liz and John that I did get quite upset in the car going to the police station um, and shouting and screaming a bit. I do remember having sort of, I suppose you'd call it suicidal thoughts because I remember um, saying things like, there must be an easy way out of this. Isn't there a sort of an inject? I made stupid statements like, you know, I'm sure there's a quick and easy way that one can be put to sleep with an inject, all that sort of silly stuff. But I guess I was a bit delirious by that stage. Um, And I didn't know these three blokes in the car, and so there was nothing sort of holding me back on that journey through the, the dark lanes of Kent in the early hours of the morning when I was at my lowest ebb. At 6 a.m. on the 10th of July, just hours after he learned the horrific news that his whole family had been murdered, a dazed Sean was asked to offer up as much information as he could with regards to his whereabouts the previous afternoon and built police a picture of the family's lives. Just as Sean was trying to come to grips with the fact that within just 24 hours, his life had been turned upside down, a development in the case brought a slither of hope. The previous evening... Sean had been told that his entire family was deceased. However, just the following morning, officers informed Sean of the shocking news that it appeared one of the girls had survived. Sean learned after the bodies had been found, someone noticed a flicker of life in one of the children and immediately rushed them to hospital. I was sort of half asleep when I remember Ed coming in and saying there's been a big development. By this time, the family had been found and taken straight to the hospital. We thought everyone had died, including the family dog. He said, we told you last night that 
we thought all your family members were dead. But we discovered this morning that one has, seems to have survived. One of the girls seems to still be alive. Sean had no idea which member of his family had survived and was transported to King's College Hospital in London to identify the survivor. At 9am, Sean arrived at the ICU units of King's College and, peering through the glass doors into the unit, he was immediately able to identify the surviving member as his eldest daughter, Josie Russell, due to the freckles on the bridge of her nose. As Sean had to deal with the fact that his whole family were deceased, and then had to come to terms with the fact that Josie was clinging to life, the news of the murders began seeping into the local community of Chillenden. The girl's friends and Liz Gregson's daughter, Lucy, recalls learning the horrifying news. I remember waking up and mum was asleep, which was really weird because she was always up before me because she started work really early. I remember being really excited that I'd woken up before her and I rushed to get ready and went downstairs and, and dad told me that he had something to tell me and it wasn't very nice news. And, and I remember being told and I kind of didn't feel anything. I think it, I was just numb. I think I was too young to really understand. Now... The idyllic, picturesque village had to come to terms with the idea that a double murder had taken place in their midst. A murder that shocked the entire village and eventually the entire country to its core. Sean kept vigil beside Josie's bed praying for his daughter to pull through and praying he wouldn't have to make the agonising decision to turn her life support machine off. Whilst Sean sat in the hospital, clinging to the hope that his eldest daughter would survive her horrific injuries, police immediately scrambled to piece together what had happened that afternoon. They secured the area where the bodies were located and also scoured a wider area just in case the killer had discarded any incriminating evidence whilst leaving the scene. With no apparent witnesses to the murders, it quickly dawned on police that their only hope of identifying the killer may lie solely in Josie Russell, if the crime failed to yield any physical or incriminating evidence. As the days progressed, Josie's condition began to change slowly. Whilst Sean was delighted at the news his daughter was going to survive, Police weren't getting any closer to identifying Lynn and Megan's killer and grew concerned that the result of Josie's injuries may present difficulties in her recollection or retelling of the attack. Whilst police begged the public for any information that may lead to capturing this killer that was still on the loose, ultimately all information provided produced no new leads. After several operations to remove bits of bone and parts of the brain that were beyond saving, Josie's speech was seriously affected due to damage to the part of the brain that controls communication. So, when she was strong enough, she began attending speech and language therapy in order to help her regain her speech. Josie proved that while her speech was impaired, her understanding wasn't, and the police and family were hopeful that with some therapy... Josie may be able to articulate what she could remember from that fateful day. Amazingly, after just six weeks in hospital, Josie was discharged, which just served to prove her determination and resilience. Against all odds, Josie Russell survived a brutal attack and attempt on her life. Within just six weeks, Josie had gone from being on the brink of death to returning home with her father. Sean recalls the day he took Josie home. Quote, We pulled into the backyard and Josie immediately got out of the car and walked like a zombie towards the house. She tugged at the door until I caught up with her to open it. Once in the house, Josie stood staring at everything that must have reminded her of her mother and sister and the life she had lost. She started upstairs with a wail growing in her throat and burst into her room. Her howling grew stronger and more anguished, and she rushed through to Megan's room, grabbing one of her sister's teddies still on the dressing table. 
Then she plunged on into Lynn's and my room, where Lynn's clothes were still visible hanging on a rail. Josie was sobbing violently now and moaning like a wounded animal between her coughs and splutterings. Josie continued her lament around the house for what seemed like an age as we longed for her to cry herself out. Outside, the Kelly family had arrived with Josie's school friend Jasmine. I pleaded with Josie to calm down and that Jasmine was here to see her now. Slowly, Josie started to settle and after a while was ready to go outside to see her old friend, end quote. The family liaison officers, Pauline and Ed, gradually began supporting Josie in piecing together the events of the attack, whilst police worked desperately to locate any evidence that would lead to identifying their suspect, a task that proved to be an extremely difficult feat to undertake, considering the nature of the crime scene. Finally, however, police had a breakthrough when a witness came forward and informed them of the location near the crime scene where they could find some blood-stained towels and clothing. This find allowed police to begin piecing together what happened prior, during and after the attack. In addition to the towel and clothing, a hammer was found nearby. While the post-mortems had revealed that the murder weapon was a hammer, It was difficult to identify whether this specific hammer was involved in the assault or was simply an incidental finding, and ultimately, this forensic evidence didn't lead police any closer to the killer. Whilst police were working hard to figure out who their brutal killer was, the community of Chillenden reeled from the horrific attack and struggled to come to terms with the idea that there may, in fact, be a vicious murderer in their midst. Not only that but they also felt like their and their family's safety was at risk with a killer on the loose. Understandably, people felt very on edge and uneasy as a result of the murders. Everyone was a lot more worried, you know, for their children. Before, you could just walk down to the field and it wouldn't be a problem. And now there's this thought that there's this just psycho on the loose, you know, and it's just not safe anymore and this this kind of pristine place where you once felt really safe you just didn't anymore a lot of the parents actually felt the need to come and be with us all at school for quite some time actually so many of them would just come and sit and have a coffee at the edge of the playground and it served lots of purposes they knew their child was safe but also they were helping us to feel safe as well It was a bit like a ripple in a pond. It sort of spread out because there were lots of little country schools in this area and it it made everybody question their safety. By Christmas of 1996, Sean had moved back to North Wales with Josie, leaving the horrific memories of that faithful afternoon behind in Kent. Nevertheless, police continued to work hard in order to bring a killer to justice. On the 1st of May 1997, Josie had regained enough of her speech to be able to describe to police the details of her mother and sister's murder and her attack, an interview which was recorded and was later used as evidence in the trial. As a result of the vital information Josie provided, BBC's Crime Watch aired a reconstruction of the attack on the 9th of July 1997, exactly a year after it had occurred. As a result of the Crime Watch appeal, a doctor contacted police and informed them that one of his patients had been making somewhat incriminating comments and exhibiting suspicious behaviours. Police took a deep dive into the patient the doctor named in order to determine whether he was capable of committing such a crime and whether he had the means and wherewithal to commit such a brutal murder. Michael Stone was born in 1960 in Tunbridge, Wells, Kent. He was one of five children, however experienced a brutal childhood, suffering domestic violence from a young age before being placed into a care home where he was abused by the people entrusted to keep him safe. Michael's criminal career began when he was just 12 years old and never ceased. When he was old enough to leave the care system, Michael immediately fell into using heroin and served three sentences at Her Majesty's pleasure in the 80s and 90s for robbery, burglary, grievous bodily harm 
and assaults occasioning actual bodily harm. On top of a serious drug habit, Michael had also been diagnosed with schizophrenia and had been classed by psychiatrists as a psychopath who presented an intense threat to society. At the time of the murders, Michael was receiving help for his mental health issues and drug addiction and was under the supervision of the National Probation Service. Following the tip-off in the aftermath of the Crime Watch appeal and reconstruction, 37-year-old Michael Stone was arrested and charged with the murders in July 1997. On the 6th of October 1998, Michael Stone's double murder trial began after he pleaded not guilty to the crime, stating he'd taken so many drugs that he had no idea where he was on the day in question. After deliberating for 15 hours, the jury found Michael Stone guilty of two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder on the 23rd of October 1998. Michael was instructed to serve a life sentence at Her Majesty's pleasure for the murders of Meghan and Lynn Russell and the attempted murder of Josie Russell. As a result of the trial, the events of that fateful afternoon, back on the 9th of July 1996, finally came to light. Meghan and Josie had attended the swimming gala and arrived back at the school by coach with their teachers and classmates when Lynn made the mile and a half walk down the country lanes with the family dog to collect them at about 4pm. Liz Gregson saw the family begin to make the walk home and attempted to get their attention in order to give them a lift, but failed to garner the family's attention. The family walked down Cherry Garden Lane, where Josie recalls them walking past a man sat in a parked car. As they passed the man, the car began to follow them down the narrow lane, before he climbed out, reached through the back window of his car for a hammer, and ambushed them. In an article written by Sean, he says, He faced Lynn and the girls, and according to Josie, he demanded money. Lynn would not have been carrying any money with her on the school walk, and she told him she had none. The murderer menaced them, and Lynn asked him if he would come home with them, and she would find him some money there. The man said no. End quote. It's believed the family were then tied up with the laces of their boots, as well as the dog lead, before being savagely beaten by Michael Stone with a hammer. When he believed they were all deceased, Michael left the scene of the crime. Michael's conviction was made possible, in part, due to a confession he made to a career criminal in a cell near his while he was awaiting trial. Damien Daly told the court how Michael had provided him with a full account of the murders and presented him with details that he believed only the killer could know. Naturally, being a convicted criminal, Damien's honesty and motives for presenting his testimony were questioned. However, the jury clearly believed Damien enough to convict Michael. The Court of Appeal ordered a retrial in 2001 due to a witness recanting their statement and a further witness testimony being brought into question. Michael was once again convicted of the crimes at the Old Bailey in 2001. On the 21st of December 2006, a High Court judge made the decision that Michael should remain in prison for 25 years before being considered for parole. Michael Stone will be considered for parole in 2023, when he will be 63 years old. Whilst Josie Russell will never forget the events of that summer's day, she has moved on and is beginning to make a life of her own. Possessing a deep-rooted passion for art and design since a young age, in 2009, Josie graduated from a college in Bangor, Wales, with a graphic design degree. Yeah, I've always liked artwork. Even when I was little, I used to do crafts, and so I've like done arts and crafts for Mm. quite a long time time and then just carried on with it and enjoy making and love working with textiles and things. That's brilliant. With the degree, Josie is a freelance textile artist based in Wales, where she designs beautiful arts printed on a variety of items, including carts, chopping boards, mugs and even tea towels. As well as a passion for arts and crafts, Josie has followed in her mum's green footsteps and adores the outdoors. On her website's About Me section, she states, quote, 
When I am not working on art and craft projects, I can usually be found outdoors, be that in my garden or else walking through the beautiful hills of the Snowdonia National Park. I feel a deep connection with the countryside, so perhaps it's no surprise that the unspoilt mountains, flora and fauna of North Wales form the present basis for most of my creative work, end quote. 25 years on from her horrific ordeal, Josie Russell is engaged to her long-term partner and soulmate, whom she met in 2005, and the pair are living back in Josie's childhood home. Yeah, I think it's nice, because I feel like I've always lived in that house, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I was really little, and we're just making it how we want it to be wanted it to be now and make it a little bit more updated. Which is really good. <laughs> it's a very old house. The couple plan to have children and Josie fully intends to follow in her mother's footsteps, whom she describes as being a great role model. In an interview with The Sun in 2017, she said, quote, I only had my mum for nine years. She was strict but loving. She did so much stuff with us. I think my mother was a good role model. Not too much TV, very hands-on, end quote. As for Sean Russell, the Liverpool Echo reported in 2001 that Sean had found love with an old family friend. The Russell family had become acquainted with Carol, who likes to be called Primmy, her husband and their two children, in 1991 when the family lived in Wales. The two families quickly became close friends, and Sean recalls that after the attacks, Carol, who was one of Lynn's closest friends and has two children of her own, travelled to Kent to support the family and could often be found by Josie's bedside. When Sean and Josie moved back to Wales, they lived next door to Primmy. Sean said of the relationship, quote, There wasn't a sudden blazing shower of sparks. We just slowly found each other, end quote, and went on to report, quote, I found my soulmate and we're going to spend the rest of our lives together. We can imagine no other future, that's all we want. Josie sees Primmy and me hugging and she's pleased. If I'm happy and looking after her and making life easy for her, then that's what matters for Josie. End quote. While the Chilindon murders took place over 20 years ago, the brutal acts committed by Michael Stone will always remain in the forefront of Sean and Josie's memories and will forever be Chilindon's legacy, a small countryside village eternally marred by the horrific murders. The only solace that can be taken is that some light has emerged from the darkness. Josie Russell survived and has made a full recovery. Despite losing his beloved wife, Sean has found happiness once again and is living with his soulmate. Despite a tragic case, it's one that to some degree has a somewhat happy ending, at least for Josie and her father. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to head over to Apple Podcasts to leave a rating and review and Patreon to consider becoming a patron of Murder and More. As a patron, for just for just $2 a month, you get access to episodes early and ad-free and you get a sticker sent to you. The link to my Patreon can be found in my show notes. To interact with us, you can follow us on Twitter and Tumblr at Murder and More, Instagram at Murder and More Pod, and Facebook at Murder and More Podcast. To view the sources and pictures for this episode, head over to www.murderandmorepodcast.wordpress.com. Have an amazing few weeks, stay safe, and I'll see you all in two weeks for another episode. Hi everyone, I'm Fern from Evidence of a Crime, a true crime podcast. 
I use extensive research to respectfully tell the stories of missing people, unsolved, cold cases, murder cases and more from around the world. I've covered well-known cases such as Jacob Wetterling, an 11-year-old boy who disappeared in the USA, but mostly cover lesser-known cases such as the disappearance of Ruth Wilson, the murder of Carl Bridgewater and the double murder of Monica and Dominique Fromm. You can listen to Evidence of a Crime on all podcast platforms or search Evidence of a Crime to find me on social media.